welcome to the Friday episode of the Dobbin Bandits. I'm Oren Phillips, and we have another home run of a show for you this week. And who are we talking to right now? Talking to Christopher Jones. Uh, a lot of you might know him for his work on DC with Young Justice. He's done stuff with Batman, The Avengers. Uh, I know him from comics, but I also know him from Sven Gulli because every week you see his artwork hanging up behind Sven Gulli because it is that amazing. Uh, Christopher's road to comic books is a really, really interesting story. Uh, he was such a nice guy to take the time to speak to us. So without further ado, Mr. Christopher Jones. We'll be talking to artist Christopher Jones. Sir, thank you so much for joining us. It is a delight to be with you today. Uh, thank you for having me. So let's start at the very beginning. How did you first discover comics? Oh, boy. I don't remember not loving comics. <laughs> um, I, I am the youngest of four kids, and the other three were all... Uh, a good chunk older than I was. And none of them were into comics hardcore the way I was. Mm -hmm. But being kids growing up in, like I said, they were, they, they're a bit older than I was. So they, I grew up in the 70s and 80s. They were growing up in the, the 60s. And uh, you know, being kids in the 60s, there were some comics in the house. So I inherited those, of course. And, uh, and then, you know, formative comics reading experiences were, uh, you know, early seventies bronze age. And, um, this is in a small town in Minnesota and we had nothing like a comic shop there at that time. So, uh, you know, comics were what were at the local grocery store or drug store, uh, very often, uh, not even individual comics. It was those those poly bagged three packs uh. that they used to have. <laughs> so you're you're trying to without breaking the plastic, which means you you know you break it, you bought it. Mm -hmm. um, you're trying to look to see what that middle comic is mm -hmm. to decide which you know which of the available packs mm -hmm. uh, you know is, is the one you're gonna buy with the money mom's letting you spend. Mm -hmm. um and uh my favorite superhero as a kid uh well and still today is batman mm -hmm. so even though i i always liked marvel just fine i love marvel characters but i grew up on a lot more dc comics because i would buy anything that had batman in it mm -hmm. and then of course you get exposed more to the other, the other DC characters as well. I you know I grew up in the heyday of uh, the Bob Haney, Jim Aparo, Batman Brave and the Bold. Mm -hmm. So that that was a lot of my my early uh, hardwire programming. Uh, that and reruns of the '60s Adam West series, of course. <laughs> so, at what point in your life do you say to yourself, maybe comics is a career I'd like to pursue? Well, I've. Again, I don't remember ever consciously making that decision. It was something I wanted to do from so early on. I always loved not just drawing, but using drawings to tell stories. Uh, my mom, like a lot of moms, like a lot of parents, uh, you know, kept a lot of my childhood drawings. Mm -hmm. And I didn't just have drawings. I had little, like, kid homemade comic books. It was sheaths of paper folded in half that I was trying to tell some kind of story. And early on, it was like a full drawing on every page. You know, the, the I hadn't quite gotten to, you know, panel to panel sequentials yet. Mm -hmm. But, um, but from early on, I mean, that was, that was the form my drawing took was trying to tell comic book stories. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, when I'm working in comics, I literally can say I've got, the job I wanted when I was five years old. It's like, you know, the kid that <laughs> wanted to, you know, be a, a fireman or something. And I got to grow up and do that. So pretty cool. I would say you have such a distinct style with your art. Like when we see your art, we know that it's yours. I mean, or did you have someone who helped you guide you along to help influence your art? Or was that just you naturally progressing? Well, it's, it's funny to hear you say that I have a distinctive style. Cause I, I, I don't know what that style is or where it would have come from. And a lot of times I don't even know how clearly people recognize it. Cause the thing that I feel has defined my career mm -hmm. is going from project to project where I have to adapt my style 
to what that project is. Um, you know, I didn't ever set out to specialize in doing a lot of animation tie-in stuff, but that kind of work was originally got my, what originally got my foot in the door at DC comics. Um, I had, I had been trying to get work. I I, I'd done by this point, I was doing some work for smaller press comics. So not, you know, it wasn't getting seen by a lot of people. It wasn't paying well, but you know, I'd had some, some stuff published. Um, I've been trying to get work at either DC or Marvel was set. This was back in the day when you had to like physically make copies of your art and mail it in as samples. If you didn't have the opportunity to go to a convention and that had editors in attendance. Um, you know, these days it's just like, Hey, check out, here's a link to, you know, my samples, but this was a while ago. Um, <laughs> and, and I had, um, I'd actually also, while pursuing that seen an ad that Warner brothers animation was looking for storyboard artists and i had done some some storyboard samples to try to get work there and while that didn't work out at the time it meant that i had produced some samples that were trying to mimic uh this was the era of the original 90s batman the animated series mm -hmm. so they were done in that style and those samples got seen by an editor at dc comics who was looking for a fill-in artist on a book that was being drawn in a fairly cartoony style. And I think the pool of artists to pull from that they knew that could do that kind of style was probably a smaller pool than a more traditional superhero style. So that got me my first opportunity and kind of like an art, uh, an actor getting typecast. Once I was known for doing that, that's most of what I got offered from them going forward even though i you know i have done a couple of non-animated things for dc over the years i got to do a batman 66 story which is great uh you know i've since done plenty of other comics doctor who and star trek and things drawn in different styles but uh you know D dc and marvel seem to mostly come calling if they need something that is based on some animation style so you know, people come up to me like, oh, I love your style. I'm like, which style are we specifically referring to? I mean, thank you. Just thank you for the compliment. But like, which style are we talking about right now? <laughs> Is there a sense of frustration, though? Because, I mean, you know, and, and we know that you can do all different things. But when they keep coming to you with the animation stuff, is it like, OK, you know, it's a gig. I'll, I'll take it or. I, well, I, I do really enjoy doing that material. I'm perfectly happy doing that kind of material. Um, the only problem with it is that there's only so much of that stuff that gets done. So, uh, you know, it would have it would have been nice over the years to have gotten more opportunities to work on other titles. Um, you know, I, I honestly think I've I, some of the stuff I've done, especially on on. Um, I mean, there's a big difference between the style of something based in like a Bruce Tim artwork style versus, uh, you know, the people that know my work from Young Justice, uh, you know, character designs by Phil Barassa and his team. Um, there's a lot more detail and, and, and it's a somewhat more realistic style than the very streamlined, very exaggerated Bruce Tim stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think there are people drawing mainstream superhero comics that like the stuff I was doing on Young Justice isn't any more cartoony than that. But because it's associated with animation, it gets seen that way. Um, so I'm th I think even doing that art style, uh, you know, I, I could have done just fine on more mainstream superhero titles, aside from the fact that I also don't always have to draw in that style. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, there, there's a sense of, you know, it would have been fun to have some other opportunities over the years and also, um, having a chance to like do my own take on a character as opposed to there are models of what these characters are supposed to look like. And part of the, you know, what's inherent to the gig is make it look like this specific show. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I don't mean to make it sound like it was any kind of terrible hardship. I had a great time working on <laughs> the Batman Strikes and the Justice League Unlimited and, and Avengers vs. Mightiest Heroes and Young Justice. Yep. Um, 
you know, opportunity to work with great writers and tell great stories. And uh, so, yeah, uh, it would have been nice to not be quite as boxed in, but I love the work that it gave me a chance to do. Are there certain projects or specific books that you look at as sort of like evolutionary points for you as an artist where, okay, I did this and I started doing this more and more that we started to change as an artist? Um, well, it's interesting. I mean, each, each project kind of pulls me in a different direction. Um, the Batman strikes was a big series for me, both because it was my first ongoing full-time comics gig. Everything I had done before that either was for a small enough publisher that like I couldn't live on what they were paying <laughs> or it was just an issue here and an issue there. Yep. Um, so that was a big deal. And obviously, I, I think I did like 45 issues of that in about four and a half years. Um, so that's a lot of Batman comics. <laughs> uh, and and even though uh, it was drawn, uh, even though the models from the show were very cartoony and, and stylized in a specific way, uh, in that case, character designs by Jeff Mitsuda, mm -hmm. Um I was trying to approach that comic like it was a straight Batman book. I mean, I'm going back in my head to that Jim Apiro Batman Brave and the Bold stuff that I grew up on. So even though the art style was different, I'm doing a lot of a lot of blacks, a lot of heavy shadows, you know, it's Batman. I'm, you know, I'm putting a lot of effort into the Gotham City backgrounds because Gotham's a character and that's that's part of to me how a Batman comic should be presented. Mm -hmm. um so that was a great experience uh but then you know you get hired to do something like doctor who where now you're drawing likenesses of actors from a tv show now is it a different art style but all your creative energy is going to a different place trying to capture likenesses and you're trying to find photo reference but you're not wanting it to look like just a bunch of photo reference all pasted together in sequence so you're trying to to you know still bring your own artistic sensibilities to it and blend characters from the show together with other characters that you're having to create that are specific to the story you're telling so uh i don't know that there was like one project that was a turning point specifically as much as every project is flexing different muscles and and giving giving you a chance to grow a little bit and then hopefully other things will come along in the future where you can go ha ha i've <laughs> i've dealt with that before let me let me bring you know these skills back into play do you like long runs on a book or do you sort of like di different things at different points uh well i imagine if i was on a book long enough it would be nice to to get a a, a change mm -hmm. um it's frustrating when, I mean, it takes a little while to warm up on something. I, you know, the first Doctor Who book I did was the uh, five-part uh, third Doctor series I did with uh, writer Paul Cornell. And I, not that I don't think the first issue looked good, but I think if you look at the five issues, like my likenesses are getting stronger and the art's getting stronger by issue five. Mm -hmm. And then we were done, right. you know? So, <laughs> you know, it, 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 you get you get warmed up you get more familiar with it you get into a certain groove mm -hmm. um it, it's nice to uh have time to kind of ride that wave for a while as opposed to the moment you get settled in the it's over right um so eh, there's i always i always thought you know going back to brave and the bold again like something like that would be such a, a dream project because you know, you get a favorite every month, like Batman, but then over time you get to draw everybody else. Exactly. So, you know, that would, that would, that would be a lot of fun. Have you found doing licensed work, there's more cooks in the kitchen than when you're doing non-licensed works? Sometimes, uh, you know, certainly um, it's, it's a different thing that you're having to answer to not just like DC editors, Tutorial to people speaking on behalf of of an animated TV show, um, you know, on Young Justice, it was pretty convenient because the guy that was the liaison to the TV show was also writing the book. <laughs> so you know, it, it just it was real real simple. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, I've had different experiences working with, you know, the Doctor Who property or other things where, you know, they'll they'll be getting really fussy about likenesses of of actors or or things where it's like, oh, if this was just a regular comic book that wasn't a a licensed thing, I wouldn't have to deal with this particular headache. <laughs> but the flip side of that is I've done a ton of superhero comics over the years and I've had next to no, uh, none of the headaches I hear about with people where, you know, we're doing our storyline and we're, we've, we've been planning this thing for a year and we almost get there. And then they say, oh, we're doing this big crossover event. You can't use this character anymore. And so, I mean, I think you get, you, you're dealing with, things outside the immediate little creative bubble of the of the team on your project regardless of what comic it is unless it's a creator owned thing that you have complete control over it's just the nature of the kind of interference you're getting is different depending on the book when when you do something like doctor who though where there is such a rabid fan base and you know they like their stuff a certain way uh, are you nervous at all or apprehensive at all going to a project like that or are you just saying you know what i'm going to do what I want to do best. Well, I mean, Doctor Who, I have had the advantage of, you know, I'm a big fan of that myself. Right. Uh, you may see a Cyberman head over <laughs> my shoulder. Um, so, you know, I felt fairly confident going into that. And it's not like there's a, there's a really specific idea that fans have of what Doctor Who comic art should look like. I just know that I need to get the details right. Uh, the most recent, Doctor Who story I drew uh, was was uh, my my contribution to um, Once Upon a Time Lord by Dan Slott. Mm -hmm. And it opens with this beautiful, so fun to draw, um, double page spread that is a sequence of of the Doctor explaining, you know, if we ever run into this one species, there you have to be very careful and this is what you have to do this speech to his companion, but we get snippets of it starting with the first doctor speaking to camera. Mm -hmm. And then you have the second doctor speaking to Jamie, his companion and moving through up through who is the current doctor in the story overall, the 10th doctor. And I not only got to draw all of those characters, but I got to draw each of them in their contemporary version of the TARDIS console room and I'm sweating every little button on the console <laughs> to have it be perfect and correct because I knew there are people that will be reading this that if I get it wrong, they'll notice and I'll hear about it. Yeah, I was going to say they won't be quiet about it. <laughs> so, so, um, but you know, that's the kind of thing that like I would care about that just for my own self, regardless of anticipating any kind of fan feedback on it um but you know it's exciting to know that you're working on something that's going to get seen by fans that are that invested in it so you know that's not something i get scared of that's that's something i get excited about what kind of relationship do you like to have with two people let's start with the writer when you're doing a project and then we'll go on to an anchor well um I have had both extremes of experiences with writers. I've had, I've had um, where I've gotten scripts that were done and I never, I never met the writer. I never exchanged an email with the writer. I had no interaction with the writer. Um, and I've had other experiences where, I mean, not only something like working with Greg Wiseman on an ongoing basis on young justice stuff where we're friends and we know each other and, he he knows what I'm going to do as an artist and is trying to tailor what he's doing in his script to the expectation of of what I'm going to bring to the table as the artist. Mm -hmm. But you know, we'll we'll chat about like, yeah, so we're doing this story. What you know, what what, what any villains you want to draw or any any locations you want to go, you know, which which is a ton of fun. Um, I've worked I've worked from full script i've worked from plot um and you know i can go into detail about any of that but i i enjoy the variety i you know each each form has its own different challenges mm -hmm. um so you know it's it's fun to do to all the different things um as far as anchors um i 
I haven't had someone else ink my stuff for a while now. In early in my career, I always had other people inking me. Mm-hmm. Um, I I was interested in inking my own stuff, and often just deadlines made that not possible. And I was getting faster and faster. Uh, when I first got onto um, the Young Justice title, the first time around, um, I had wanted to start inking that right away, but I came onto it. Um, as a replacement when the the artist that had first been assigned to that series left Mm -hmm. and the deadline was so tight i said to them um how about we find an anchor for the first few issues or you know two or three issues and uh i'll just pencil to help us get up to speed Mm -hmm. and and dig out of the whole the whole schedule hole that we're in yeah and uh and then at some point uh I'd, I'd like to take over and, and ink this myself. And that's what we did. Uh, so that, that was the transition point. Um, and, uh, and now these days I'm inking uh, digitally. I, 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 I love, and I miss uh, working with physical media. I still do that with like sketches and commissions and things, but as far as uh, pages um, one uh, digital is faster. Mm-hmm. Two, um, uh, I found myself more and more working on projects where things needed to have some digital steps done anyway. Uh, things like you know elements delivered on different layers, mm-hmm. or or uh, I needed to do some computer graphics and incorporate them into the artwork. So uh, as long as I'm sending a digital file as the end result anyway, I might as well just do the whole thing digitally. Sure. Um, but then the third thing is. Uh, as as comics have moved away from something exclusively consumed on paper at a certain size to things that are people are looking at on their computer and they can blow up a whole panel and and uh, you know my eyes aren't terrible but they're not what they were when I was twenty. Uh, trying to do all this little fine detail work is like oh boy I enjoy working in a medium where I can just blow a face up to the size of my screen and get the lightness I want and then zoom out again. Um, But, you know, I I've gotten to work with some great inkers in the past, you know, as, as a style experiment, I think it would be fun to, to collaborate with an anchor again. Um, I, you know, I like having the control of, of doing the line art a hundred percent myself. I still think there's plenty of collaboration in, the fact that a colorist is going to come in and have a huge uh-huh. impact on how the, the artwork looks, uh, the letterer as well, uh, the the most unsung, underappreciated element of the comics creative team. Um, uh, but, uh, but overall, I'm happy inking my own stuff. Let's talk about the moment you were told, okay, you're going to be doing Batman, because I'm sure here you are, the kid growing up, reading Batman voraciously and suddenly you're the Batman artist. Oh yeah. I mean, um, well, I actively went after that job. Uh, I had been, I had been doing some work for DC. Uh, some of which was on. uh, Okay. So for a while, um, when, when DC was doing a tie in comic for the justice league animated series, um, early on, it was justice league adventures. And then eventually the title changed to Justice League Unlimited. But um, uh, they, for whatever reason, decided to structure that book as they had a pool of writers and a pool of artists and everyone just kind of rotated through. So I was doing two or three issues a year, Mm -hmm. which was not enough to keep me busy. I would have been happy to do every issue, but that's not (laughs) what was offered to me. Um. But I've been doing that and having a great time with it. And I saw that they announced that there was going to be this new animated series, The Batman. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I know how this works. There's going to be a comic book tie-in that goes with that series. Mm -hmm. So rather than wait for them to announce it, I'm going to try to find out now who's going to be the editor on that book and try to get that job. Mm -hmm. And it worked out. I found out who the editor was. 
Uh, apparently one other artist had already inquired about it. They had us both do sample pages and I was lucky enough to, to get the gig. And so I, I was the regular artist on that book for its entire 50 issue run. Um, they, they uh, occasionally would tell me that they were going to have a fill-in artist come in and do an issue. Um, I never knew why. I There were a couple times I was getting tight on deadlines, but I was never late on that book. So I don't know if they just liked having someone else uh, to use a sports metaphor, which is very ironic for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> if they liked to have someone else on the bench that they knew could do it if I got hit by a bus or something. I don't know. I don't know what it was. But uh, with the exception of these occasional filling issues that they surprised me with. Um, you know, I, I stayed on that book for the whole 50 issue run. So, uh, and that was like, I said, great excitement. Uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, I didn't, I didn't try to treat that like I'm drawing a cartoon Batman book. I was, I, I really approached it as, okay, I have to stay reasonably close to the models from the show so that, you know, this comic reflects that show. But in terms of of thinking, you know, about visual storytelling, I approached it as a straight Batman book. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna tell do this as dramatically as I can. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I you know, and the thing the feedback I got on that book um, at when I would do conventions, I had a lot of fans come up to me that really appreciated that book, and some of them, you know, very much it was because it was an all ages Batman title, and it was parents that said oh this is a batman comic i can i can read with my kids and i enjoy it and they enjoy it like and that's all cool but also there were a lot of fans that like could have cared less that it was connected to an animated series they they appreciated the fact that it was kind of old school batman it was batman and robin and batgirl and they fought a different villain every month and it was done in one stories and it wasn't it wasn't you know, a, a six part or more uh, drawn out uh, involved thing with a lot of adult content and, and like, which is all fine. Right. But, you know, uh, Batman and Superman and all those characters, you know, started out as escapist juvenile adventure fiction. Right. And I feel like, I feel like any character popular enough to sustain multiple titles if they're coming from that kind of an original place, one of those titles should still be an all ages friendly, casual reader, accessible, self-contained version of that character. And, you know, do all your convoluted, interconnected, shared universe, you know, uh, older audience stuff mm-hmm. in the other titles. But like save one for being just the, yeah, this is what I remember when I was a kid kind of version of the character. <laughs> well, speaking of books that are, are slightly a little different, you do some horror books too. I mean, you've done Reanimator, you've done Kolchak. Uh, is it a whole different mindset for you when you're starting to do these things? Uh, well, I mean, that's those are a couple of deep cuts from early in my career. I, I, I find it highly ironic that I ended up being – uh, best known for doing all this animation tie-in <laughs> stuff. And like one of my first gigs was doing the comic book adaptation of Reanimator. Uh, <laughs> like, oh, well, yeah, that's maybe, maybe maybe the 12 year old doesn't want to check that one out. That, <laughs> I will save that for later. Um, yeah. I mean, you're still, the the content is very different. But the the skill set you're using in terms of both not just drawing but visual storytelling yeah. isn't that hugely different. Um, you know, you're still you're still creating drama in, in the, with composition and the lighting and and all of that. You're 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 designing characters and and outfitting them in wardrobe and creating locations to create mood and reveal characterization and all of that. So, uh, yeah, very different content, very different kind of story, but I, I don't know. I mean, you know, especially, especially the kind of shadowy dark atmosphere that you would use for a horror story, like that carries over to something like Batman pretty well, (laughs) or doing Dr. Who, Maybe not as uh, dark and hard-edged a horror as as Lovecraft 
uh, Lovecraftian material, but still you occasionally like, oh, here's a monster scene. We want it to be scary. So it carries over. There's a there's a through line. You've also done, you know, independent work too for for different groups. And you know, do you sort of need that to to do something where there's not as many parameters on you as you have with DC and Marvel? Uh well, I mean, it's not like I not like I uh am just like, oh DC and Marvel are so limiting. I have to go elsewhere to have the cre- experience the kind of creative freedom I yearn for. I, you know, I go where I can find the work, um, and uh, and sometimes those opportunities uh, are on on smaller scale projects, independent projects. Um, you know, the 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 variety continues to be fun and exciting. It's it's great to work with different creators on different kinds of material. Um, uh, certainly, uh, some of the more independent stuff, there's a little bit of a sense of there being a half a dozen people signing off on every last little thing you turn in. Um, but that isn't usually that huge of a burden anyway, because I'd like to think that one of the skills I have is figuring out fairly quickly, what is it you're wanting me to deliver? Okay. Now that I understand that I can give it to you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like I said, I go where the work is to date. What would you say is you at your best? Me at my best. Um, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm the same way when someone asks like, what's your favorite movie? It's like, Oh, ask me on a different day. You'll get a different answer. <laughs> I like, I like, you know, it's like picking between your kids. You like you, uh, ugh. but, um, I mean, one of the strongest overall packages, the mo- the most recent opportunity that Greg Wiseman and I had to do a, a run on Young Justice, uh, Young Justice targets, between the fact that um, it was me getting to come back to that material in comic book form after having had a chance to actually work on a season of the show doing storyboards, mm-hmm. uh, I felt like I felt like my my drawing chops had improved. I felt like my my facility with that specific material had been strengthened by by working on the show i had better access to um uh resources like like official backgrounds and 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 reference from the show um and then you know the 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 scripts were strong um i i was really happy with uh the uh, the color we had on that I mean, we we had color on the original great color on the original run of the comics as well but I I thought like if if the goal of those comics was to give Young Justice fans an experience that was as close to getting a new episode of the show but in comic book form as possible um, I I thought those that that run of of six issues was like the best we had we had done at delivering that um so that was pretty that was pretty satisfying to work on i would i i would do more of that in a heartbeat and talking something a little different than comics now some news broke a couple of days ago that your art is for sven Gulli's 45th anniversary on the air uh you're on the the show this week yeah uh, how did yeah. all that uh we had a chance to chat uh at c2e2 a few months yeah. ago uh i Sanguli, that that is a um, whole thread to my career that I wouldn't have anticipated. Um, <laughs> I, I, so you know, Sanguli, uh, as, as you mentioned, forty fifth anniversary has been around for a while. Um, I didn't discover Sanguli myself until his Chicago based show went national on this Me TV network. Um, I was living in Minneapolis at the time, and I so I discovered the show when it became available there through MeTV, and uh, I I became a fan. I was going to be uh, in an artist alley at the C2E2 convention in Chicago, and saw that Svengulli was going to be there on Saturday doing a signing. And I thought, oh, it would be fun to to meet Sanguli. I usually when I go to conventions, I don't focus a lot on 
what other guests are going to be there or what celebrities are going to be there because I don't spend my weekend chasing down other people to meet and standing in lines. Like I'm, I'm doing my own thing and working my own table. Right. Um, but I thought, Oh, it would be great to, to meet him, but I've gotten to a place with meeting celebrities. You know, I've, I've helped start a convention. I've worked on conventions. I've attended a lot of conventions. Mm -hmm. I've had enough opportunities to meet celebrities that I've, I've kind of over the 30 second. Oh, hi. I'm a really big fan of your work conversation. Like if I can actually have a, a chat with them, that's great. But just the whole, just the you know, the generic, they're not going to remember me thirty minutes later kind of conversation. Like uh, I, I'll admire them from afar. It's fine. Um, but I had the thought, if I did a piece of artwork uh, that I could give uh, uh, him as a gift, that would be a great icebreaker, and I bet we could get, at least have like a five minute conversation, and that would be cool. So I did a portrait of Singuli uh, in a style kind of based on the work of Basil Gogos, who is best known for his wonderful um, famous Monsters of Filmland covers, um, which is not something I'd ever attempted before. And I'm working digitally. I'm not working with paint. I've never, never done well with paint. It's one of my failings. I I, I don't. <laughs> I've never found a physical medium for color that I do well with at all but digital i do okay um so i i did this piece i i managed to reach out um online to uh the his producer on the show mm -hmm. and just said you know i've got this thing i wanted to give him I, yeah if you could let me know like whether it's coming over to where he's doing his signing whether it's you guys roaming around the convention capturing footage for the show which i i knew was a thing they did like let me know when would be a good time. I'm willing to come to you. You can come to me, whatever. I just, I'd love to say hello to, to, uh, to Svenguli and I'd love to present this art. And we worked out that they came over and got it and they ended up liking it so much. It got added to be a permanent part of their set, which was beyond any expectation I had at the time in doing it. And if it had ended there, <laughs> I'd have been like, Wow. That was amazing, more than I ever could have hoped for. But it led to um, a couple of years after that, um, they made a deal to do a little cross promotional thing mm -hmm. with DC Comics, where they did this Svenguli meets the uni DC Universe story that was serialized in a number of the DC comic books, and then they did a collected version of just those pages. Mm -hmm. that they used as a um, giveaway at Svenguli signings. Yep. And uh, when DC asked the Svenguli crew, did you have a particular artist you would like to, to get to draw this? They asked for me. Amazing. So I got to do that. And then during um, a COVID lockdown, they were being asked to produce new episodes of their show at a time when they didn't have access to their studio. So they started doing episodes where it was just Sven in front of a green screen background. And there was a piece of artwork uh, with a, a, a bat cave style, but Sven Gulli themed mm -hmm. background um, that, that like I said, one of their staff artists did, which is a fine background. It was great, but I, I, I saw it the first time and I thought, oh, if they don't have a variety of these, this is going to get old really quick. <laughs> you can't be like walking around to different parts of your set and interacting with things. Like it's just locked off head and shoulders with a you know piece of artwork behind him. So I reached out again to um, uh, producer Jim and uh, said, you know, would you guys be interested in some additional backgrounds just for the sake of variety? Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, oh, we really don't have anything in the budget to, to offer you to like, that wasn't my question. Would you like right. some additional pieces? And they said, I'm sure. And I ended up doing like five or six of those, um, which again, if that had been the end of it, I would have been thrilled. But then, but, uh, but, you know, now it's been uh, th this uh, Svenguli comic that they just did with uh, uh, Frank Miller's new comic company. Um, the, uh, uh, 
shirts for Svengoolie's um, uh, 40th anniversary and and the the uh, introducing these new Sven Squad characters and now the 45th anniversary. So it's been this whole ongoing association that has been so fun for me as a fan of the show. Uh, I enjoy getting to help them out. It's, it's work for me, which is great. Um, and, uh, you know, cache with a whole legion of Svengooli fans out there. So yeah, it's been amazing. I have to say that portrait you did is a masterstroke because the coloring on that, it's not, there's a, you know, you mentioned Basil Gogos. It's, it's so difficult when you're using the shadows and the blues and stuff like that, but you managed to put that together so perfectly. I mean, it's really striking every time you see it on the screen. Well, thank you. I, well, I mean, again, it was, it was looking at the work by Basil Gogos and trying to analyze what his uh, stylistic tendencies, g- gimmicks, if you want to call them that were, and he he would do these these portraits of classic horror characters that the likenesses were very accurate, but then he would be really expressionistic with the color. So you you'd have you know the lighting that that allowed you to very clearly model uh, the face, but then he would do these splashes of of green or yellow or red and you know, these this really unnatural color palette that just made it very you know lurid and you know just a very fun vibe mm-hmm. for these these monster drawings on the front of famous monsters of filmland and so that's what i was trying to bring to it and so uh, aside from you know the very kind of psychedelic paint splashy background uh, you know, there's a big wash of green up the side of Svengoolie's face. And, uh, yeah, it just, it came out really well. Um, and, uh, my only regret is not knowing how big of a deal it was going to be at the time I presented it. <laughs> I put it in a frame just to protect it, right. but it was just this really ba- basic plain frame. And they just took that and put it on the wall. I'm like, Oh man, I really want to give him a new one that has like this ornate <laughs> kind of gothic, you know, just something that that feels like it fits the vibe of the set a little more than just this sort of like you know bought it at Target kind of uh, <laughs> kind of frame that it has. Well, but, actually, you're probably the only comic artist who once a week millions of people get to see their art on television. <laughs> It's it's amazing. I was telling I was telling a a friend uh, yesterday that I was talking to online um, after after uh, that that segment aired on on this last weekend's episode of of the show. It's like yeah, saw myself on national television, puttered around, calling it a night. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's my evening life in the fast lane. There you go. <laughs> um, yeah, it's 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 a it's a strange thing, but it's it's fun. Uh, being able to you know see you know on on uh, social media and stuff people reacting to mm-hmm. to something that has gone out across the country and outside the country it's it's wild now you've worked on batman you've worked on the avengers i mean you've worked on big characters are there any characters that you've yet to work on that you really just w- can't wait to get your hands on um <sighs> Well, there, I mean, it's it's an endless list. I'd love to get to work on everybody. I'd love to have had the kind of career that people like, you know, uh, George Perez and John Byrne have had, where they've got they got to draw everybody at like all the major companies. Um, you know, even characters that I've gotten to draw, so many of them I've drawn in the context of some animated thing. You know, a lot of the stuff I've done for Marvel was either on. Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes. So it was done in the style of that show. Mm-hmm. Or I did some stuff uh, around an even cartoonier show that they had called Marvel Superhero Squad. So there's a lot of characters that like I've technically drawn, but I don't really feel like I've <laughs> properly drawn. And uh, you know, I've spent more time at DC than Marvel. So I, I think most of most of the ones that I'm like, oh man, I'd really love a chance to do so and so. Are probably a lot of Marvel characters. I'd you know I'd love to do the Fantastic Four. 
Um, I'd love to do something X Men related. I I always I loved Alpha Flight as a kid. I always wanted to do Alpha Flight. Um, uh, Moon Knight was always a favorite, and like you know, Marvel has decided that Moon Knight is a character that they're going to put you know someone with a very edgy style like David Finch mm-hmm. on. So like I'm probably not the first person they're thinking <laughs> of with my very clean uh stuff and it's like oh i can i could do like a moody film noir moon night it would be so cool um so, but there's a, there's a ton at both companies i'd love to do legion of superheroes mm-hmm. uh, over at dc that would be a blast um uh but you know even things i've done like you know i've done i've done doctor who but there's a lot of other doctors that i haven't gotten to draw yet <laughs> so yeah yeah I, I, it's an endless list You've mentioned before that you're also doing writing. Could you see that's something that you're wanting to do more of? Or are you happy? Oh, to- I, I did writing very, very early in my career. And I I, I would love to uh, do more of that, I suppose. It's just, it's, it's a skill that I have not developed as much as my art. Okay. Uh, it takes me longer to put a story together just because it's not a practiced skill um i mean most of the writing i've done in the last many many years uh hasn't been for comics i i um i helped start a convention uh when i was still living in minnesota uh which is held over july 4th weekend it's called convergence it's fun come check it out um but uh uh i have written sketches for that over the years i i help write uh opening and closing ceremonies for that every year, which is, it, it has a lot of kind of humor and sketch comedy interwoven with all of the, uh, with the announcements and more formal, uh, elements of it. Um, so, you know, I've, I've done a lot of that sort of thing. Uh, I, I haven't, I haven't sat down and like written a comic story probably in 20 years. Um, so I have, I have a ton of ideas, it, you know, it'd be fun to be on a project where, uh, I was less of a hired gun and could have more of a collaborative mm-hmm. uh, uh, relationship with, with the writer, mm-hmm. uh, you know, but that, that comes from either having uh, a lot of uh, given a long leash by a publisher uh, on some property of theirs or doing something uh, creator owned, which I'm not opposed to, but finding an opportunity to do that, that pays well enough that I can afford to right. do that and, uh, and uh, pay, pay all the, the rent and the bills is, is, you know, an ongoing challenge. It's the trap, it's the trap you fall into. It's like, it's, it's easier, I think, to find opportunities when you're starting out to do something that may not pay great, but like, you know, okay, I'll do this on the side and I've got the day job. And then you, you reach a point where, Okay, no, I I only got so many hours in my day to put into this, and it's what I do for a living. So it's if I'm going to put those hours in, it's got to be, it's got to pay at a certain tier that I can afford to 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 spend the time on it. And then you suddenly you know find yourself like, oh, so now I really have to work for a company of a certain size, and it has to be mm-hmm. this sort of a this sort of a project. I, you know, I've, I've kind of priced myself out of some opportunities that maybe don't have quite the paycheck attached. <laughs> oh, well, that's problematic, but you know, it's a trade-off. And we are back. Yeah. Another guy who loves horror. He loves comics, uh, cartoons. He is a brethren to all of us and we wish him so much continued success. Uh, if you aren't familiar with his work, get familiar with his work because it is absolutely phenomenal. So Christopher, love to have you back. And thank you again. And gang, guess what? We are almost running out of time. You're asking, what are you out of time for what? For voting for the CBC Awards. We need your help. Go to cbcawards.org. Check the Dodd and Bandits. And vote for all the other wonderful YouTube and podcasts that are out there. They all work so hard to bring you entertaining and informative programming. That's what we aim to do. And uh, we're so uh, thankful that you guys put us in for the nominations. Let's get to the next level, guys. If we can win this, that would be huge for us. So please take the time. Uh, I think the reveal is November 2nd. So we're less than a month away. Uh, CBCAwards.org. We appreciate it. Have a wonderful weekend. And we will see you next week. Mm -hmm.